Hey guys, it's Nick. You know, getting a 5% yield on your bonds is nice, but people always want just a little bit more. So is there a way to get a better yield on the bonds that you buy? Of course, you can buy junk bonds. I mean, um, high yield bonds and get a better yield than what treasuries are currently paying for the same term. But as always, with more reward comes more risk. So I'm going to look at junk bonds, look at their yields, and talk about if the extra yield is worth the extra risk. And if you think it is worth that extra risk, then I'm going to look at some junk bond ETFs, including the new Schwab high yield ETF, and compare them to other popular ones like HYG and JNK. So first, what are junk bonds? Junk bonds are either investment grade bonds that were rated AAA or whatever and got downgraded to triple B or worse. And so those are called fallen angels. Then there are the junk bonds that were originally issued as junk bonds, meaning this company did not have a good rating, but they issued these bonds anyway in triple B and they're paying a higher yield to account for that extra risk of default. Now, junk bonds are usually less sensitive to interest rate risk. For one, they usually have a lower duration, and that's because most junk bonds are issued for 10 years or less, and they are usually callable in the first four or five years, so they can call those bonds back if interest rates go lower. So even though they have a lower duration generally and are less sensitive to interest rates moving, when the stock market moves down, they become highly correlated to stocks. So these high yield bonds are kind of cyclical because in good times when the economy is good and the markets are good, a lot of money managers buy a little bit more of these high yield bonds just to reach for some extra yield to beef up their returns, and they are kind of complacent when times are good. But when things turn, and they usually turn very quickly, these things can tank very quickly, and therefore the yields increase to very high levels at the time. And so the spread over treasuries increases and widens uh, on the way down in the stock market. And so those are usually the times to buy HYG or JNK or any high yield bonds when they have a big spread over treasuries or corporate bonds. So then it's easy, right? When the stock market tanks, just buy high yield bonds and sit on them and you make this high yield for a long time, right? Not really. Because even if you buy during a panic and the yields explode on the high yield bonds, the duration of those bonds are usually like three to five years or something like that. So that means that these bonds will mature and new bonds will come in. And so you'll only get that extended yield for a few years, maybe like a three year period or so. So basically the only way to get a good yield on high yield bonds for the risk is to wait for a really bad stock market and the yields increase over treasuries, you buy the high yields and then hold them for about three years or so. Now that is a lot of work and waiting around for most people, but it could be something to consider if you're interested in getting a little bit more yield every once in a while on your bonds. So let's go take a look at some charts and data of how this works. So this picture kind of explains reaching for yield. It works until there's no more steps or you fall off the ladder. And so they say high yield bonds behave like equities, especially in bad markets. And so you see in these periods of drawdown in the market, high yield bonds becomes very correlated to stocks. And here's a chart of the spread of the yield of high yield bonds versus treasuries. And this is the average line about six percentage points over, but it's been trending down these days. Now it's more like 4% right now. But you see it spiked to 13 percentage points in 1990, about 11 and a half percentage points in 2002, and even about 19 percentage points over treasuries 
during 2009. I remember this period here. And so it even spiked during the pandemic, but now it is below or right about at trend. Now, why do they call them junk bonds and how often do they actually default compared to investment grade bonds? Well, investment grade bonds have defaulted at an average rate of 0.09% since 1981 with a standard deviation of 0.11. And in 18 of the last 41 years, no investment grade bonds have defaulted. Now, this is usually because the bonds have to fall from AAA to BBB to C or whatever before they actually default. But the average high yield rate of default is about 4%. And during three different years, 1991, 2001, and 2009, high yield bonds defaulted at a rate of more than 2.5% their normal rate. So in other words, this dark blue line is the rate of default of investment grade bonds, almost none, like one tenth of 1% a year. This is overall all bonds, this light blue line. So you see in times of distress, they can go up to about a 4%, but this includes investment grade and junk bonds and everything in between. But for junk bonds, this yellow line the average default rate is 4%. Now that includes CCCs and everything like that. So they default more than the triple Bs, but still, and during times of turmoil, that default rate can spike two and a half or almost three times the normal rate. So you see in 2001, it spiked to about 10%. And in 1991, it was about 11%, 2009, also like a 10% default rate on high yield or junk bonds. And here's a more current chart of the spread of junk bond yields over treasury bonds. And you see in 2008, November, it was almost 20 percentage points over treasury bonds. Even during the pandemic, it was 8.77% over treasury bonds. And right now, it's only like 3.97% over treasury bonds. And the historical trend is like 5.4% over treasuries. So this is an inverted chart of that. And here is the trend line. And here are standard deviations above and below that trend line. And so look at what it shows you is that when people get complacent and they are willing to buy high yield bonds that are yielding one standard deviation below the long term rate of 5.4%. Usually that ends bad and it goes back to the trend line or even lower. Now these green lines show standard deviations above the historical trend line. And you see when it gets to one or two standard deviations above the historical spread between treasuries, that is a great time to buy high yield bonds. And so you had it 2001, 2002, right? 2000, late 2008, early 2009, as well as 2011, 2016, and 2020. But these spreads don't stay around forever. They eventually get back towards the historical trend line or even above it as more bonds in the HYG ETF or whatever mature and they add newer issued bonds at the regular historical spread. So this is why I'm saying that these high yield bonds are really outperforming only for periods after a huge blowout in the spreads and then for maybe a, a three year period after that. But then the rest of the time, the risk that you're taking for holding these things over treasuries or investment grade bonds doesn't really warrant the risk. And so looking at these bond yield tables, you see the high yield over here, BAA, BBB, it doesn't show anything worse than this like C. So the yields here for say a five year are 7.59 versus treasuries of 4.07. So it's about a three and a half percent difference right here at three years. It's also about three and a half difference and two years also about three and a half percentage point difference. 
Now, looking at the two-year high yield versus AAA corporates, two-year, it's only about a 2.6 percentage point difference. The five-year difference is about 3.2 percentage points. So you see, when there's no big market turmoil, the spread between the high yield and AAA corporates or treasuries is not that big. Think of it like this. If treasuries were filet mignon and AAA corporates were like ribeye or something like that, and junk bonds or high yield was like 80% hamburger meat, you know, 20% fat, 80% beef, something like that. Now, if filet mignon is priced at $6 a pound and ribeye is $5 a pound and hamburger meat is $4.80 a pound, why would you buy the hamburger? You would just buy the filet mignon or the ribeye. But in times of turmoil, that hamburger may become a dollar a pound while the filet mignon is still five or six dollars a pound. In that case, yes, you would load up on that hamburger meat because the price difference is so much. So if after all of this, you still are interested in possibly buying some high yield bonds or a high yield bond ETF or want to just watch it for the time when the spreads justify the risk and you want to get in for a few years, let's take a look at the new Schwab high yield ETF compared to HYG and JNK. So this is the new Schwab high yield bond ETF. The symbol is SCYB. Now, why would you buy this new ETF that doesn't have a lot of trading or assets under management yet compared to HYG or JNK? One reason, the expense ratio, 0.1% a year. The other two ETFs are at least four times higher than this. So right now, not a lot of volume trades. So I wouldn't recommend buying this right now because the bid ask spread is 0.06%, which is basically half of the yearly management fees, right? A little bit more. So this thing is really just a few days old, actually. It only has assets of about $28 million under management. That's going to increase, of course. So this attempts to follow the Bank of America U.S. Cash Pay High Yield Constrained Index. And it holds 660 bonds. And these are the returns of the index that they're benchmarking against. 10-year, 4.3, five-year, 3.7, one-year, almost 9%. But that's after it fell a lot, probably in the year before. So this is kind of a bounce. So what are their holdings right now? The number one is some money market. I'm sure that's going to change in the future. But you got the usual Carnival, Ford, Rakuten, and you can actually download all the actual holdings here and see American Airlines, Iron Mountain, Tenet Healthcare, United Rentals, Transdime, which the other ones hold as well. Yum Brands, DaVita, Dish Network, Univision. Now, there's not a lot of info on this yet on these ETF websites. I guess they don't have the data yet, but this sales sheet from March 31st, and it says updated July 11th, tells you things like the weighted average maturity is 5.32 years. The effective duration is 3.83. This one has the number of issues at 1901, and the composition, about 50% BB, 40% B, about 10% triple C or worse. Think of it like the BB and the B are <laughs> regular ground beef and the CCC and this other stuff is the asses and elbows and stuff that fell on the floor and whatnot that they put in the hamburger meat, right? And this info from March has Transdime, Dish Network, Tibco, Caesars, Carnival, and all of that, which you'll see in the other ETFs. And about 19% is less than three years, 31% three to five years, another 32% five to seven years. Now, although these are, I guess, estimations before it started trading, if you look at the details of HYG and JNK, they will be very similar to what the Schwab High Yield ETF holds. 
So looking at the Spider Bloomberg High Yield Bond ETF, otherwise known as Junk, J-N-K. <laughs> so 8.5 billion assets under management. So it is huge, but the expense ratio 0.4% or 40 basis points is four times higher than Schwab. Now, this is where it's very confusing because this 30-day SEC yield says 8.16%. And that's supposed to be based on the 30-day period ending on the last day of the previous month. The yield is calculated by dividing the net investment income per share earned during that 30-day period by the maximum offering price per share on the last day of the period. I don't know how they calculated this, but this is total BS. And so a more accurate yield for this product is this, the estimated distribution rate. And that's calculated by first annualizing the most recent distribution and then dividing that by the most recent closed price. So in other words, if this fund paid 50 cents last month, you assume that's what it's going to pay for the 12 months going forward. And so if you want to calculate it yourself or understand what the real yield you're getting, not this 30-day SEC yield, which makes no sense to me, go to Yahoo Finance, put in the symbol, click on historical data, click on dividends only, and hit apply. So you could say the last dividend in July was about 50 cents and say, I'm going to get that every month. That's about $6 a year in dividends. Or you can go back the last 12 months, add this all up and see what that comes up to and also use that as approximate dividend. And doing both of these ways, you see the dividend is more like 6%, not anywhere near 8%. And doing the same thing for HYG, right? July had an 80 cent dividend, but these other months are like 35 cents, 45 cents, so you can't base the whole year on one dividend. There might be some capital gains in here or something like that. So assume the yield on these high yield ETFs is more like 6.3 or so percent. And looking at the top 10 holdings, Transdime, Tibco, Advantage Loyalty, Dish, Carnival, Caesars, very similar to Schwab. Now looking at HYG, you see the expense ratio is 0.49%, almost five times what Schwab charges. Their net assets are 14.5 billion. Again, SEC yield is 8%, maybe based on that 80 cent dividend last month. But the real dividend is more like 5.62%. And the holdings, again, Transdime, Mozart, Tibco, Dish, Advantage, Caesars, the usual suspects. And HYG has an effective duration of 3.59 years, very similar to JNK, which is three and a half. And so I expect the Schwab is about the same. So whether you're buying a really high yielding dividend stock only to see the company cut their dividend because they're having problems, or you're buying some... Uh, 20% a year cryptocurrency yield farming thing that turns out to be a scam. It's always the same. Extra reward only comes with extra risk. So never mind what the SEC yield says, 8%, or that these charts are showing a four percentage point difference over investment grade or treasury yields. The reality is these ETFs are paying something like 6% or so. In my mind, that doesn't warrant the extra risk over a treasury bill or a corporate AAA bond. There may be a point when we have market turmoil and that changes significantly. At that point, you may want to reconsider and look at some of these junk bond ETFs. And if you do, you'll probably be better off going with the Schwab only because of the much cheaper expense ratio. But as it is right now, filet mignon and ribeye and New York strip steaks are only about 50 cents a pound more expensive than 80-20 uh, ground beef. Which would you pick?
Thank you.